Welcome to the dialogue on digital BRICS. Uh, this is the seventh in the series of dialogues that we are hosting as part of the BRICS academic process under India's BRICS presidency in 2021. It is my distinct honor to welcome Dr. Rajiv Kumar, Vice Chairman Niti Aayog, to deliver his keynote address. Dr. Kumar, over to you. Thank you, Akshay. Um, Namaskar to everybody. 2021 marks the 15th year of the BRICS uh, organization. The cooperation has come a long way. And on this momentous occasion, when India is the chair of the BRICS forum, we have recognized the importance of leveraging technology and digital solutions to achieve the sustainable development goals and the 2030 Agenda. The Government of India has emphasized innovation and technological advancement to empower its citizens. On the one hand, India has leveraged adva these advancements to provide basic goods and services. In it, initiatives like the JAM Trinity have linked bank accounts with the national unique ID under Aadhaar. This ensures seamless direct benefit transfers, removing leakages and improving the service delivery across more than 400 schemes on which direct benefit transfers take place today. On the other hand, initiatives such as the Atal Innovation Mission and Startup India are identifying young entrepreneurs and innovators and providing them with the necessary market linkages to scale up their ventures and make them globally competitive. BRICS is an ideal platform for multilateral collaborations on technological advancement and for the delivery of digital public goods. These goods, these digital public goods, are essential to try and remove the digital divide which currently marks most of our emerging economies and the BRIC members as well. These digital public goods can range from the health sector to skilling, to education and financial inclusion. The diversity of the grouping provides a number of case studies and best practices that can be adapted from and adopted by member states and other emerging and developing economies. Within the BRICS, cooperation in digital technologies and innovation offers immense potential. One whole low-hanging fruit is flow of goods and services. The common BRICS framework on digital trade can potentially sidestep legacy issues around international trade and unlock the vast potential offered by e-commerce. From an industry point of view, the next stage of growth in the technology sector will and must come from small and medium enterprises. In India, we have recently redefined the small and medium enterprises and given them greater space and greater potential to grow by enhancing their revenue and investment limits on to, under which they can still continue to receive the benefits available to the small and medium enterprises. Those enterprises which are located in developing and emerging economies will benefit much more with the technology advance, which will afford them better access to credit, to marketing, and to new technologies. The BRICS grouping has the potential to lead this evolution by providing small and medium enterprises a platform to identify market opportunities and to promote and to provide much needed capital at reasonable rates. The BRICS New Development Bank can perhaps identify potential unicorns and provide them with the necessary market linkages to expand their business and ramp up their volumes. Underlying the potential of digital technologies and innovation is access. As technology increasingly becomes a tool for governance and commerce, it is imperative that marginalized communities are not left behind. 
the fourth industrial revolution the fourth industrial revolution uh, will develop a culture of innovation and calls for better tools for governance and commerce it is imperative that the marginalized communities uh, take participate in the fourth industrial revolution and we 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 achieve inclusive growth and prosperity to all the role of women in particular must be focused upon while the fourth industrial revolution unfolds in the future years ladies and gentlemen i want to bring to your notice an important issue that we think can provide a much needed uh, initiative for the brics and this is the potential collaboration for the development of our future citizens the school children the atal innovation mission within niti aayog has established 7500 tinkering labs across the country and this is a model that can be adapted and adopted by other countries for the benefit of our school children more importantly perhaps an exchange of such young talent between brick member countries can create leaders of the future this is already happening between india and russia and we have had three rounds of this in once and on one year in the presence of president putin and prime minister modi i commend this initiative of bilateral and multilateral student exchange among the brick member countries for us to set up a model for future global citizens which recognize the importance of collective progress in working together thank you very much i wish the panel all luck namaskar thank you dr kumar for addressing us today uh, i now invite sunaina kumar senior fellow with the center for new economic diplomacy at orf to introduce the topic and moderate the discussion over to you sunaina thank you akshay hello and welcome to a new edition of the brics academic dialogue where we will be engaging with one of the most pressing questions of our times which is about our digital futures in today's discussion we will explore a new framework for cooperation on technology and innovation today with the pandemic we find ourselves in a moment of global crisis and in this moment our dependence on technology has intensified and we are facing common challenges as well as opportunities brics member states account for 42% of the world's population which accounts for 42% of a most valuable resource of our times which is the data of 3.2 billion people digitization holds the promise for economic growth for innovation and the potential to create societies that are truly inclusive but digitization also has its downsides and its unintended consequences like security threats and data breaches and issues of misuse of technology particularly in democracies to discuss some of these issues and to look at the ways that brics can collaborate uh, and the role that brics can play in creating frameworks on global tech governance we have a stellar panel with us today and uh, i'd like to introduce them we have uh, professor karen costa vasquez she is assistant dean at the center for african latin american and caribbean studies at the op jindal global university she is also associated with the center for brics studies at fudan university in china and her research areas cover south south cooperation and development financing with the focus on brics dr alexander and alexander moreskina is head of the structural reforms division of economic expert group in russia she has been involved in research on the role of brics countries in global politics and the economy dr priyadarshi dash is associate professor at research and information systems for developing countries a policy research institute in india he works on programs on g20 bimstech and the indo pacific on topics like trade services 
and regional financial cooperation. Dr. Yu Tao Zhu is president of the China branch of BRICS Institute of Future Networks, and he focuses on digital technology, 5G, and the Internet of Things as some of the topic areas. And finally, Mr. Ashraf Patel is a member of the South Africa BRICS Think Tank Network. He focuses on issues of digital regulation and innovation policy. Thank you and uh, welcome to our panel. And we're really looking forward to having this discussion. Um, I would like to begin by uh, by perhaps uh, um, getting opening remarks from you. If you could share from your country perspective the opportunities and challenges that you see in the digital age, and especially in this moment of the pandemic that we find ourselves, if we can begin with you, Professor Vasquez. Thank you very much, Akshay. Thank you very much, Sunaina, and all the team at ORF for inviting me to this important forum. Um, BRICS are today at the epicenter of some of the most important changes in the world. And I'm very glad to see space for our scholars to discuss, but also to propose the way forward. And, and today I'll, I would like to make three very brief uh, points. And I apologize beforehand if it sounds a little bit too skeptical, my, my other BRICS fellows uh coming afterwards we'll have a chance to to mend it on a more positive tone uh but my first point is that uh, from my perspective uh, the bricks that they have not yet been successful in designing and implementing its own agenda in the field of, the field of information and communication technology icts um and looking at the most recent meeting of the foreign ministers of the BRICS, uh, which happened uh, earlier this month uh, the five countries highlighted the importance of ICT for growth and development. Uh, they also highlighted the need of a comprehensive approach to ICT development and security, including to safeguard security of states and the public interest, um, while respecting uh, the right to privacy of individuals. Uh, the BRICS Ministers of Foreign Affairs also underscored uh, the leading role of the United Nations in forging uh, universally agreed norms, rules, principles, for responsive behavior of states and to counter the use of ICTs for criminal purposes. And finally, they also reaffirmed the importance of having a legal framework for BRICS cooperation on ensuring security in the use of ICTs and advancing intra BRICS uh, cooperation through the implementation of a BRICS roadmap for practical cooperation. But these three points, they essentially repeated the leader's declaration of last year's summit in Russia. Uh, with no new elements. On the contrary, the Leader Summit last year when further to acknowledge the work uh, towards a BRICS agreement to ensure uh, security in the use of ICTs, uh, though without making um, any firmer commitment. Uh, my second point uh, today is that uh, a common agenda, whichever common agenda in the field of uh, ICT could immensely increase BRICS participation in international trade and specifically in cross-border e-commerce. Uh, according to the United Nations Development Economic and Social Affairs, uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, the countries of the Global South have contributed to more than a half of the world's growth in recent years. South-South trade in ha is higher than ever, and today accounts for more or less more than a quarter of the world trade. Um, BRICS scholars, uh, many of these BRICS scholars, and including a good friend, Henata Thiebo, have pointed that uh, as facilitated an affordable form of international trade, cross-border e-commerce could boost uh, world trade and, 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 and growth even further uh, than the numbers that I've um, mentioned uh, just now. But it's still incipient, and, and incipient for a, a few reasons. At first, that we still have very unclear definition and differenti differentiation uh, between e-trade and goods and services. The second reason is the lack of harmonization of laws on tariffs and technology transfer, on data protection uh, and cybersecurity as well. Uh, also limited knowledge sharing, uh, which is something um, that, that it's key at this, this forum. And, and finally, the inexistence of clear measurements for cooperation. So this is to say that several blocks uh, have enacted provisions on e-commerce for enhanced intra-block cooperation and ASEAN 
for instance, is the most advanced one with different e-commerce implementations and particularly regarding law harmonization in the fields of online signature, consumer protection, data protection, cybersecurity. But now my third point, my third and last point, is that uh, despite the, the leadership in, in, in many of other uh, regional blogs and, and, and coalitions, in the case of the BRICS, uh, we still have no provisions on e-commerce. And, and this is precisely one area that I see high potential for cooperation, which is law harmonization. Um, but uh, this would not be without question marks. Uh, and why? Um, it is true that China has made significant strides in digitalizing a broad range of essential services. It's true that India uh, has deployed ambition, uh, ambitious nationwide uh, biometric uh, identity cards, the Aadhaar card. Uh, and in both cases, however, uh, these measures have been followed uh, by huge controversy on data residency and data protection. Um, and, and Specifically with data residency uh, laws, uh, governments uh, today, they, many governments, they require companies to store data on their national territory. Uh, but uh, the data protection and privacy laws uh, restrict data transfers and do not require retention of data anywhere. So there is a conflict in, in legislation, uh, in, including the legislation that is adopted by many of the BRICS countries themselves. Uh, and data residency also impacts commerce, uh, favoring local companies over foreign competitors as the former can comply uh, with data residency more easily than, uh, than the foreign competitors. Uh, and data residency also limits cooperation in technology transfer and research and development and so on. So I think unless we tackle, unless we discuss issues like law harmonization across the BRICS countries with all the challenges that this entails, of course, uh, it will be very difficult to boost uh, um, ICT cooperation and ICTs uh, specifically. Um, and despite the great positive impact that practical cooperation and ICTs could have on BRICS in the world, uh, I believe that issue will remain at the discourse level. Uh, this would reconfirm uh, what what have been calling the bilateralization of BRICS relations, um, in which uh, members they limit cooperation when their interests diverge and benefit from collective action uh, through breaks when their interests converge. And so this gives members more flexibility as they manage their various uh, domestic and international challenges and which is crucial uh, for the grouping to survive uh, in the long run. Uh, it's important to have some degree of flexibility um, it also makes more difficult for the five countries to cooperate as a coalition, as a group, in the pursuit of common objectives. Um, so these are my three points. Uh, thank you again very, very much. I'm very much looking forward to hearing my other BRICS colleagues and, and, and the questions as well. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Professor Vasquez. And uh, some of the points that you raised are actually they, they lay the groundwork for where our discussion should be headed, including highlighting uh, the great potential for the block. And also, um, as you said, that uh, a lot of it is likely to remain at the discourse level. And this is something we should return to. For now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Moros Kina to share her perspective. Uh, thank you, Sonaina. Do you hear me? Everyone hears me? <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, just to check. Nowadays, you have to check every time uh, you start your presentation that everyone hears you. Uh, so, first of all, thank you, ORF. Uh, thank you, Sonaina. Thank you, Akshay, for inviting me to this uh, dialogue. <coughs> And um, I would uh, like to add uh, to what Sunaina said uh, um, that we have um, uh, challenges uh, associated with the, the digitalization. And one of them, or one of the um, most important of them, is digital inequality. Uh, digital inequality is uh, um, on the um, priority list for all BRICS countries. It's uh, part of the um, Sustainable Development Goals uh, 4 and uh, 17. And it has long been on BRICS agenda, um, actually, since uh, 2015. 
Uh, so it's an important issue, but uh, some of these, uh, some of the aspects of uh, this issue hasn't been covered yet, um, which are extremely important. And uh, first of them um, uh, is uh, digital um, uh, gap on the domestic level. There are lots of um, uh, lots of national wide indicators of digitalization, and uh, they are uh, good for comparison and. Um, between countries and uh, they show some uh, success of BRICS countries and by some indicators they are even on the level of developed countries and sometimes surpass them, for example, China by the media users or <coughs> Russia by the international bandwidth. But um, uh, to um, properly formulate the uh, digitalization policies, we must understand uh, how uh, these policies affect uh, the least developed regions of our countries, how this affects uh, the most vulnerable groups of uh, our countries. And the national-wide indicators, are, uh, as we in Russia uh, have a joke, uh, an average temperature in the hospital, uh, which doesn't show anything. Uh, some uh, people have a higher temperature and some have have a lower temperature and average is fine. Um, and uh, here and the, with the national wide indicators, we might uh, uh, have the increase in these indicators uh, because of the um, um, expansion of uh, usage in the most developed regions and uh, the lagging behind of the least developed regions. Uh, and when uh, you try to um, evaluate uh, the domestic inequality between the in-country uh, in regions, uh, there are um, very scarce data and uh, they are very fragmented. Uh, so we must uh, um, do uh, um, formulate our policies. So we must first create a framework for um, uh, statistical evaluation of uh, um, the domestic inequality. So this is my first point. And the second point uh, uh, is um, uh, that with the development of uh, the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, uh, <clears throat> the second um, the second level problem uh, comes to the first front. Uh, and this is digital literacy. Um, <clears throat> So when you have an opportunity to um, use the digital technologies, you must have this proper skills for, for using them. And uh, for all of BRICS countries, this is an urgent issue. Uh, in uh, BRICS, in, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, in Brazil, in China, in South Africa, uh, there are um, um, <coughs> uh, uh, population um, uh, interviews uh, conducted uh, where um, there is a question uh, what is the main obstacle for internet usage uh, for your family for your household and uh, uh, the lack of uh, internet the ICT skills uh, is among the three um, three main uh, aspects uh, so um, in uh, Russia and in India, there are methodologies, uh, uh, there are uh, regular assessments of uh, uh, digital literacy levels, and Russia uses the European met methodology, and India has developed its own methodology. And uh, uh, I think that uh, BRICS countries, and uh, as an uh, expert centers for the developing countries, uh, they often position themselves as the uh, expert centers, must uh, step up uh, in the global um, on the global. Uh, governance stage uh, to proper formulate the uh, digital literacy framework. There, there is uh, no um, universally accepted digital literacy concept, and uh, uh, this European methodology, which is overly complex and uh, overly focused on uh, um, uh, digital consumer and media space, and and so on, uh, is likely to be. Um, uh, to be used as a as a global um, as a globally accepted uh, um, uh, concept, but uh, it doesn't uh, take into account the interests of uh, developing countries. Uh, the Indian methodology is more focused on national priorities. So BRICS countries may uh, have a, uh, may create a joint ambitious agenda on the digital lit uh, literacy. They have all the uh, all the opportunities to do that. So to conclude, I see lots of room uh, for cooperation in two very practical fields. First is the development of domestic. Um, uh, um, 
of um, domestic framework for evaluation of um, uh, uh, of digital inequality and the second one development of digital literacy concept thank you thank you very much uh Professor Moraskina, and and of course, uh, COVID nineteen has laid bare uh, the digital divides in our society as much as it has intensified digital adoption in every country. Professor Zhu, if uh, if you could offer the perspective from China. Yeah. Um, thank you. And morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> Uh, it's my great pleasure to join this um, dialogue today to share our uh, views and experience. And we believe that the digital economy uh, bring us a new round of the scientific and the technological revolution. And and I think this uh, could improve the, the quality of, and the efficiency of the economy. And we have a lot of um, uh, technology could be used. For instance, the cloud computing, big data, 5G, Internet of Things, and AI, etc. Um, we noted that uh, these techniques um, are now is um, valuable for us to uh, use these techniques into the traditional fields. And um, so, in China, in uh, 2019. We um, conduct the competition. That's the blooming cup of, of a 5G applications competition. We are trying to uh, promote the development of the um, uh, applications um, of the 5G system. Actually, it's not only 5G. Uh, it could be uh, include the, the the cloud computing and the big data and also the IoT and there are many many ICT techniques could be used for the traditional traditional fields. So we conducted this um, competition to promote that kind of trials and the, the, the cases. So this year is the fourth year for that. In the past three years, we received uh, more than 8,000 uh, um, cases of the 5G application in many, many um, rural areas. And um, for instance, the the, especially in the in the manufacture and in the education, uh, some cases in the hospital, uh, we have a lot of that that kind of cases. But uh, we are, um, after the breakout of the COVID nineteen, um, we we noted that uh, this um, speed up the, the application of the five G uh, in the you in you in that case of the usage. Especially in the, I mean, you know that the, in the hospital area uh, we have a lot of uses that, and also in the online education, and also the cloud gaming, um, but not only of this. Um, for this year, we are holding the fourth um, competition of the five G application, and uh, we note that uh, we have a lot of um, interest uh, from the. ICT uh, industry, we are trying to provide the ICT technique to the traditional fields. But well, from the traditional uh, industry, they have their demands, but um, sometimes they don't know uh, what ICT technique could provide to the traditional fields. So what we try to do is to um, be a bridge for that for the ST industry and also for the industry fields for that. Um, but been, after the three years and more than uh, almost four years um, uh, test, then we noted that we what we need is the new modes of the, um, and then maybe the new mode of the business because we can have a lot of trials. We can have some uh, cases for, to, for the test, but um, what we can do, although if we want to move further, uh, go forward, we need to find the values. The values mean that the cases, all the 5G application cases, need to provide the value to the customer, to the system provider, and to all the um, players here in the chains. 
So what we are trying to seek is that we are trying to support the, the ICT um, industry and uh, to fund and uh, to to analyze the demand the demand and um, uh, from the industry and maybe the traditional industry and they will, uh, we also trying to try to develop the standardization for that because you know uh, if we use the ICT techniques to many many different uh, traditional fields it will be very very complex and difficult so what we are trying to do is to, to develop uh, uh, the standardization based on our uh, trials and based on our uh, the cases we received uh, maybe for this year we will ho have more than 5,000 um, five application cases uh, for this year's competition. So, um, so for BRICS countries, I think we have the great population, we have the industry, we have the interest for that. And maybe we need, what we, we could do is um, to share our experience, especially, especially in China, we have a lot of uh, many years. Personally, I have been involved in this Year for many years, so we can share our experience. Uh, maybe we can uh, try to find the uh, best way to uh, provide more, maybe standardization, but maybe not. But I think that uh, in the following years, uh, for each in traditional fields, we need some uh, the ICT experts to provide our ex um, techniques and the experience and the trying to bring our ideas to to the different industry, different area. Um, in that case, maybe we can find the new modes of the business. That's what we can do. And uh, that's what the kind of the, the techniques could be used. Um, otherwise, uh, the trials is still trials. It's my experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Dr. Zhu, and uh, as you said, China's leapfrogging into advanced technologies, and there is a lot to learn from that. It also brings up important questions of, of legislation and norms uh, for global governance, uh, something that we perhaps could get to later in the discussion. For now, I would like to invite Mr. Patel to offer the perspective from South Africa. Uh, good afternoon from South Africa. Thank you, Sanaina. Thank you, ORF, and all colleagues present. Uh, a, warm, a warm welcome from South Africa. Um, I'm going to um, go through my slides. Uh, I'll, I'll be fairly fairly brief. Um, and after each slide, I'll just say uh, next, and then maybe um, uh, you can continue. So uh, if we could proceed to the next slide. Ah, thank you. So basically, the we all know the framework of the 4IR discourse um, emerged uh, at the WEF, World Economic Forum. It gained traction in 2006 particularly. And um, in our research um, in South Africa, we've been looking at what are the impacts, the developmental impacts. We work from the premise that BRICS is uh, looking at the needs um, of the Global South. So one of the big ones, uh, challenges, is the labor disruption and disarticulation, um, impacts uh, around cloud sourcing seems to be going to lower cost hubs, and then of course uh, the deregulation of capital and labor markets as key drivers. Uh, next slide. Um, the theory on distribution and exchange, uh, we're all aware of it. The big drivers, uh, colleagues have articulated, uh, datafication is generally accruing to large companies. Um, correctly so, uh, the, the model of data is the new oil. Um, there seems to be a crisis of uh, in contradiction on, uh, of overproduction amidst poverty. And so this, in our view, in uh, most of the crisis uh, in the digital economy is a continuation of the crisis in the uh, goods and services economy. So, um, you know, data is not linked, is not delinked from the contradictions of uh, the normal economy. And, and so the inequalities we see in labor markets, uh, in manufacturing, in services, in mining, all of this is reproduced um, within the information economy. 
uh, some questions for further research, uh, you know, stimulus packages um, within the um, uh, post-COVID uh, uh, recovery programs. We're seeing uh, a move towards uh, government uh, expenditure and more um, reliance on the state. So it's very important that the developmental state issues come, come up. And then we're also seeing within um, South Africa, Southern Africa, there's also reproduction of labor, gender, and class dynamics. And, and, and we thought this would be very important uh, areas for, for studies in inequality. Next slide. So as we, as we take on the debates, um, um, uh, I do agree with some of the colleagues uh, that we, we, we need to look beyond the 4IR methodology. Um, if BRICS uh, grouping or the BRICS cluster seems to create, uh, seems to intent uh, with a new discourse, um, are we going to stick within the 4IR framework, which is a world economic framework? Uh, is partnerships in the ICT sector uh, amongst the BRICS uh, 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 annual communique, we talk about lots of activities. There's cyber BRICS, for instance. There's also uh, issues around uh, the partnership for 4IR. Um, you know, so questions within BRICS study areas is, is the BRICS partnership for 4IR, is it something different from the World Economic Forum? Is it a continuation of it with some adjustments? So these are some of the research questions that, that we can focus on. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of my slides talk about the WTO e-commerce uh, treaty. And that was my case uh, in, in the slide deck. And so the, the question um, we, we can pose is, where does BRICS nation stand, for instance, in issues around the e-commerce treaty? There are opportunities and challenges. And, and one of the challenges in the WTO uh, around multilateralism uh, are going to be very, fairly big, significant issues. Obviously, we know the issue on the COVID, the IP waiver, uh, much has been written about it in the past week. Um, most of the BRICS countries or developing South countries seem to be supporting the need for uh, intellectual property exceptions. Now, given COVID is a pandemic, that could be a model going forward. Do we want to, so one question is for research, for the research, do we want to extend uh, digital economy and industrialization issues uh, using this IP model, IP waiver model? Um, you know, we have the United Nations in frame frameworks, for instance, the UN Industrial Development Organization. Um, I've read some good reports on digital industrialization. There's also the UN Commission on Trade and Development, UNCTAD. Um, I find Speech the report very good. Uh, Mr. Patel, thank you so much. And um, okay. I know that you, you still have these uh, slides, but we need to uh, yes. move to our next discussant, sure. um, Professor okay. Dash from India. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, let me thank Warip uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, timely uh, debate on digital bricks. RIS is also uh, a collaborator in this uh, uh, forum. Uh, colleagues have already uh, touched upon several areas of uh, digital economy. See, a couple of points I just want to um, summarize. First of all, digital economy has become a multidisciplinary uh, uh, issue. Uh, digital economy itself is a force which needs to be studied as a sector. Digital, like, digitalization and development, that interface has to be studied. And digitalization and people. Digitalization and people, what uh, Dr. Uh, Alexandra uh, mentioned, digital literacy, I'm, I'm expressing it as di digital empowerment. So if you see from all these three angles, what is happening in BRICS countries and what is happening largely in the uh, domain of developing countries and emerging markets, digital consumption of digital services has increased significantly. But in terms of embracing digital production technology, 
if you uh, uh, see the latest report by UNIDO, they are saying BRICS countries and by and large are in the followers group, not in the front runners group, except China. And South Africa, as per their assessment, uh, I am saying, is, is importing technologies in the uh, So if we connect the economy with our lifestyles, big countries are coming off in a very large way. Now coming to the digitalization and development uh, aspect of uh, uh, the whole debate, there are, there are two, three ways one can approach. During COVID, we saw that how much of difficulty one could face if you do not physically move. But then you have some respite because digitalization had already gathered momentum before COVID. The services that you were availing over smartphones, over social media platforms and all these actually empower people to immediately accommodate this new challenge and try to explore what they can do. So how much of those COVID experience can be really capitalized? as a basis for empowering people. Now, who got empowered? Maybe the urban middle class, maybe the elite section. But when you go down in the social strata, still language becomes a barrier. You need to provide solutions, customized solutions in local languages so that people understand. We have schemes in India for farmers. They can send SMS and get what type of soil they should use, what type of fertilizer they should use. How many of those use, we do not know. We have several novel schemes as a digital health program. So all these which are still um, evolving and which needs to be replicated also. India has been uh, fairly successful in uh, providing an identity uh, through this other system. And uh, one of these uh, benefits of that was successfully transferring the money to the respective beneficiaries bank accounts, which was uh, difficult logistically before. And there were also misappropriation on the way. So what is happening now, the integration of the, the larger sections of the uh, society who are not integrated with the formal financial system, they are now integrated. The, the, uh, the solutions, financial services solutions are now accessible in mobile apps. So FinTech, FinTech is one of the products, uh, this uh, the beautiful uh, product uh, segment, which is emerging because of new digital technologies. And I believe that FinTech is going to empower people like anything. What is happening that you do not visit a branch, but besides settling your payments and uh, say doing shopping, what happens you browse through several of things which Dr. Alexander from Russia mentioned, literacy, to know what are the various products available, how to save, how to uh, transfer money, which was not happening because RBI used to do this uh, financial literacy empowerment uh, through specific con uh, Thank you so uh, much, uh, Professor Dash. Sorry to interrupt. I'll come back. I'll come back later. Okay. Yes, absolutely. We're, we're running a little out of time and there's just so much to take on and so many perspectives to hear. Uh, I'd like to turn to Professor Vasquez next. And uh, actually, it's a question which perhaps is uh, come to all uh, all our panelists today because every BRICS nation is uh, is grappling with the question of data protection and privacy. And uh, there are data protection policies in the works in every country. Uh, I would like to know the Brazil perspective on this to begin with. And then if we can take this question around and hear what are the common learnings from this. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, and as Professor Dash uh, mentioned, uh, digital economy has uh, all different uh, facets, the digitalization and people, laws and governance and infrastructure. In the specific case of data protection, I think it's it's very critical uh, um, as, as the world is globalized and more and more interdependent uh, uh, and, and, and you have an increasing need uh, to protect data and privacy, but at the, uh, on the other hand, 
uh, to what extent can you actually do it, uh, right? Because the technologies are so impermeable uh, and, and connected with different systems that uh, unless you have really stringent uh, regulation systems, but uh, ultimately you, you, you're reliant on the technology that it's serving um, your country, right? Um, I believe that the, 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 the least that you can do is to, to create a, a set of norms and regulations and, and institutions uh, to which uh, citizens can, can recur to, uh, but ultimately uh, uh, the, the technology and the systems are, are ultimately dictating um, the, the, the flow of data. Uh, and this is very, very much, much more difficult uh, to be controlled. Uh, so, in a nutshell, I think this is this is one one aspect to look forward, uh, ensuring the the right the proper regulations and systems uh, within the countries and across countries as well, uh, especially when we are talking about uh, cross border uh, trade and and connectivity amongst BRICS countries and, and other countries in the world. Thank you for that. And uh, Dr. Morazina, is that something uh, that you would like to add to? Uh, yes, actually in uh, Russia, this is one of uh, the priorities and it's a uh, part of the Russian digital economy national project. Uh, it's our uh, main project in the field of uh, digitalization. Uh, now it, uh, it's been adopted in 2019 and uh, it um, it's to be um, I uh, realized uh, um, up to 2024 and uh, one of the issues in it is the information security and uh, in the information security project uh, there is a statement of uh, um, <clears throat> uh, on the personal data protection and uh, our um, uh, Measure there is the creation of uh, the special resource uh, to which uh, all the citizens may apply and create uh, some uh, um, um, some application <laughs> uh, when uh, when they think that uh, their personal data are misused. So this uh, this is our main main measure in the field, uh, which are part, uh, which is part of the, our federal project. Thank you for that. Uh, Professor Zhu, uh, if you could also chime in uh, on this aspect. And also, uh, since you've been talking so much about advanced technologies and how you're working closely on your research with them, uh, what is the big challenge for China uh, when it comes to technology? Would it be data privacy and protection? And what else could it be? Well, I think the data protection and also it's a very, very important and a critical issue because we, we have um, some experience to use the ICT techniques in different areas in the smart cities and in manufacturers. And, but we noted that um, what now, for now, what we can protect the, the data for personal um, is only we think the 5G or 4G system is, is um, a possible way, but it's not what we say the, the the data protection. So for IoT systems, um, maybe it's we don't have any cases or any techniques to protect the data. So we are thinking how to protect the data because you know um, every every um, you know we have a lot of uh, application, but uh, we have a lot of data, but we don't know how to protect that kind of data and uh, how to use that kind of data. So we have big data, but we don't know how to, in what kind of policy we can use this data. So the data protection and also the information security and also the uh, the rules to use that kind of data, especially the personal data. Um, is what is an uh, important issue we are discussing, but we don't have any solution. But we noted that what we are doing, the applications of the ST techniques, we have the risk to uh, ask us to uh, find a solution to protect the personal data. And uh, we are developing some um, policy 
to see if we could uh, uh, use that candidate based on these policies, but um, we don't have uh, enough experience now for that. Okay, uh, Mr. Patil, uh, there there have been questions uh, in every in every country around data sovereignty, and South Africa has also talked about uh, prioritizing data sovereignty, and there are various interpretations of what it is and um, and the whole idea of, uh, of protecting national interests uh, could you could you tell us the the south africa perspective on that yes um thank you colleagues uh, broadly speaking uh, south africa follows the un model so for instance we would follow closely let's say the itu um unido uh, UN Commission on Trade and, and Development. Um, within the Global South, I mean, we follow a lot of the debates, let's say, for instance, in the South Center, some of the research coming out there. Um, and we have very active um, ambassadors to the World Trade Organization. So we, broadly speaking, we take a position of the developing South around uh, data sovereignty, uh, we're seeing the debates emerging in the e-commerce um, uh, debates, the WTO e-commerce debates, where we we want to retain elements of data sovereignty um, for for national development, uh, because the current um, borderless model is not working for us, in a sense that it's not allowing our local innovators to create their own enterprises. So as a result, we very uh, totally dependent on foreign vendors, especially multinational corporations. So there's a great opportunity for cooperation amongst uh, BRICS countries and others on some form of intermediate technology development. Um, so South Africa is a medium country. Uh, we, we, we're in an interesting space and, and uh, we've seen it with the COVID vaccines. We've been totally dependent on large multinationals corporations, it's been a big challenge for us. Same thing with data, same thing with, with agriculture. Um, you know, it's a borderless world. In fact, the big news this morning in South Africa, our one of our major crypto exchanges, AfriCrypt, the founders disappeared with $3.6 billion just this morning. So two youngsters, they were running a crypto exchange, uh, 66,000 Bitcoins are missing, and there's no, there's no trace of them, two youngsters. They're very tech savvy. And uh, so they disappeared with $3.6 billion, which is a lot of money for investors. But at the regulatory level, our reserve bank and the financial sector authorities can't get involved because it's not regulated. Uh, they haven't got a policy framework. So we're in a very interesting space. It's a borderless world. It's very complex. Uh, citizens are investing in alternative currencies, but without a regulatory framework, you do get these big, uh, big ticket um, uh, items and corruption happening. So it's very challenging and we're in an interesting space and we hope to learn from other countries. Well, uh, that in fact right there tells us uh, what happens in the absence of regulatory frameworks. Uh, Professor Dash, is that something that you would like to comment on? And we do know that tech is not neutral. It needs to be governed and yet there needs to be a balance between openness and innovation. How can we strive for that? And uh, what do you think India is doing in that space? I think uh, to continue what I just uh, thought of uh, telling in the uh, first slot, see the future of the economic growth and development will be innovation driven. And data could play a very big role in that. Data is not just for the commercial purposes. Of course, e-commerce companies would be asking you a data to put in that which credit card you are using would you like to save it or not up to that extent but you need data for e-governance as well uh, so so when you want to offer public goods in the digital platform you need data the governance is also going to be data intensive so it has been uh, a very contentious issue how much protection you would like to have in India and uh, the the larger thinking community uh, has been offering this idea, localization of data. Localization of data is not something which is prohibitive 
or which is not uh, allowing the data to be shared. Rather, it says that there should be sufficient flexibility at national level to determine how much of protection and privacy should, should be restored, depending on the stages of the development of society. Uh, that is one. Second, if you want to harness data, what type of enabling framework also you should have? Both has to gel together. Because the uh, if you see, uh, take this debate to G20, uh, G20 Japan said uh, cross-border free uh, uh, data flow, cross-border uh, free data flow, and there are a lot of hue and cry over that. So it is less understood at this stage, but you cannot say that you, do, you don't have to share data. You have to share data for the future of the economy, and we need data for e-governance. We need data for uh inclusion uh, offering uh, projects on inclusion offering projects on health of uh, projects on fintech only the contentious part is the cross-border component of that that can uh, be approached from the localization of data perspective uh, which is also uh, when we say localization of sdg the same logic could apply here but it would take time to negotiate what can be done uh, I, I was just uh, reading somewhere that the efforts are underway to develop joint BRICS, Fourth Industrial Revolution Development Agenda. So if that is something we are aiming, um, we'll find a way um, among the BRICS countries to um, to resolve this trade-off. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Uh, Professor Vasquez, uh, we began this discussion with you outlining how you think there is huge potential and uh, it is underutilized. And you just heard from uh, Professor Dash. Uh, and you know, uh, would you say there is one area that uh, that that BRICS could collaborate on in the digital realm in terms of a solution? If we were to find one. Here? Uh, I, I, it's fairly there is uh, there. Are... Uh, I didn't want to sound that negative <laughs> or skeptical at the beginning. It was but realistic. Really are. <laughs> realistic, exactly. Um, but there certainly uh, are many initiatives at the, the the different technical working groups, and 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 I was expecting other colleagues to mention the work of the New Development Bank has been doing a lot of uh, um, work in in infrastructure investment, including to 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 foster innovation. Uh, digitalization and the readiness of, of, of the BRICS countries to to enter at what Professor Dash was saying, uh, the, the, the 4.0 industry uh, and, and how it connects with the development agenda. Uh, so there certainly are many, many examples. Um, uh, I would particularly uh, want to see more being done at the, as, as we've uh, been discussing, uh, uh, Professor Patel also mentioned uh, the regulatory frameworks. I think this is crucial. Uh, so, so yes, while there is a lot of uh, initiatives happening, um, if I would like to pick one uh, going forward, certainly investing the regulatory frame frameworks uh, based on the experiences that, that our countries are, are already having. And and I apologize. I will have to to, to disconnect in a few minutes as I'm um, I'm going to to another meeting uh, starting at. 9 p.m. my time, so this is my, my third shift, <laughs> actually. That's a long day for you. Thank you so much for joining this discussion and for sharing uh, this perspective. Thank you. Thank it's you very, pleasure. very much once again for the invitation, and I learned a lot from all of you today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Professor Moriskina, I know that you're also in a hurry, um, and perhaps uh, these could be the closing remarks from all of our speakers. Uh, I would just like to ask you the same question, really. If you were to find one area of collaboration for BRICS, uh, what would it be? Well, actually, I already mentioned it in my introduction remarks, and I would like to uh, stress it again uh, and uh, highlight that uh, I think that digital literacy is uh, lying in the uh, in the base for everything in the digitalization process, uh, and BRICS can really step in with the joint agenda in the in this field. 
And um, also, I didn't mention uh, during the answer um, on your previous question, but uh, digital literacy also contributes to the uh, secure of the personal data. Uh, because you have to understand uh, how to protect your personal data. You have to understand when uh, your right to protection of your personal data is uh, uh, um, is not there. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, I think that digital literacy is uh, is basics uh, in the digital economy, like an alphabet, like a multiplication table, and. Uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, there are um, consumers in the digital era have to understand how to use their data, how to um, how to use the technologies. Uh, so uh, not how to put uh, a video on on YouTube. Uh, that's uh, that's something uh, completely different. But uh, but the very basics. What is uh, the program? How does it work? Uh, because uh, you know my grandma doesn't understand. It's uh, I miracle for for her uh, how, how this she says that uh, I push a button and it doesn't work so she has to understand that if you push the button it does work the program is uh, very stupid or uh, either you didn't push it uh, or um, you didn't switch on your phone or, or something you, that, that doesn't doesn't work that way. And uh, these are these are very basics. And this is what we have to formulate uh, the, the concept of digital literacy to assess it and to formulate the policies aimed at increase of digital literacy. Thank you. And I, yes. And I have a quick follow up question on that. Uh, would you say there's any country uh, that offers a, a best case scenario or an example in bridging the digital literacy gap? Well, actually, there are there are really good um, moves in uh, India okay. and in Russia towards uh, um, uh, and actually it's a priority for all uh, for all of the country. I um, uh, I wouldn't mind say that all of the bricks are uh, going in the right direction and <laughs> in that way, but. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Russia and India already assess digital literacy. Of course, they are doing uh, it uh, not in a proper way from the uh, researchers' point of view, uh, but uh, they are um, they are trying to do something. Uh, at least uh, they they didn't bridge it uh, or or anything uh, yet uh, because no no one actually did. Uh, uh, but uh, only in collaboration, only in cooperation, we can find uh, we can find the right solution. In Russia, the framework is too comprehensive. In India, it's too narrow. It's, uh, the, um, uh, the ideal uh, uh, concept is somewhere in between, and uh, only when uh, um, discussing these issues, we can find the right way. Thank you. Thank you for offering that thought. Uh, Professor Zhu, uh, what, what would you highlight as, um, as the one common um, agenda that the BRICS countries would look at? Well, thank you. Um, well, I share the view that uh, the network security and the data protection would be very, very important for us. It's the challenge for all countries and it's also what uh, we are trying to uh, find a solution, but I think maybe it, it will take a long way for us to and uh, to do because um, SCT technique could be used for many years, but uh, the security would be very, very important. And it's, it's great challenge for us. Which area I think will be uh, maybe the most important uh, uh, um, point for three countries to if you can cooperate and perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Patel, would you agree with that, or would you look at uh, another uh, concept? I think um, all the countries have specificities and 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 and, and priorities. Um, from the African continent, you know, we've just signed the Free Africa Trade Continental Agreement. That's very huge. That's uh, one billion uh, people in in the African market, and for BRICS uh, or Digital South. Cooperation, I would definitely state that the real innovation is going to come from small and medium enterprises. So if there's one message we would send is uh, small and medium enterprises um, are showing considerable innovation because they're being led by youth 
and uh, they want to break away from the, the multinational model, which is very restrictive because of patents and IP and all of that. So I see uh, unique opportunities in innovation platforms uh, amongst BRICS countries, uh, sharing uh, of SMEs. So how do we take, uh, let's say, products, uh, crafts and arts, uh, let's say in rural Africa, using e-commerce platforms and then take it to the BRICS market and to the developing world. And, and, and that for me is the real game changer. So, but we need a really solid e-commerce framework and agreement at a WTO level that is, is generally fair, but really uh, empowers the new generation SMEs. I, I would say that could be a game changer. Right. Thank you for that, uh, Professor Dash. Uh, th those are some ideas that apply to India as well. Uh, what are your thoughts? I think let me uh, not just think uh, something new. Uh, I just uh, refer to what BRICS countries have recently agreed. On 25th, uh, 24th February 2021, the first finance minister's uh, meeting uh, was held. And there they have emphasized on two areas use of digital technologies in general, fintech for SME and financial inclusion. So if you ask me pick one of these, so I would go for the second one, fintech for SME and financial inclusion. Let me tell you why. You know, uh, Indian economy is largely uh, for the last uh, one decade has been service led economy. And there are certain sectors of services uh, which are growing much faster than the traditional sectors. For example, financial services, hospitality sector, of course, during COVID it has gone down. So what is happening? It is between the large farms and the very small farms. So everything that new happening, all digital solutions, all uh, crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending, everything sounds good for the large farms, those who can afford to do that. SMEs are actually not getting benefit of that because they have low ratings if you go by the, uh, the standard metrics followed and they have low capital base, low collateral also. So the FinTech solutions offering them 5 lakhs of working capital, 2 lakhs of working capital support, could be a big game changer for the industrial ecosystem and that will apply to startup. Thank now, you what so about much. Uh, sorry, we're just <laughs> running out of time entirely. Uh, done. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. Uh, we've had a fascinating discussion and much food for thought and we hope to continue these conversations with you on BRICS Digital Dialogue. Thank you for joining us.